My name is Ron Sawhill, and I serve as the program coordinator for the undergraduate program in landscape architecture here at the CED. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Associate Professor Jose Butrago, who holds a, a bachelor degree in landscape architecture from Penn State and a master degree uh, from Harvard. Uh, Professor Butrago has served on the CED faculty since 2002 and teaches a wide variety of courses, but I must say he specializes in design communication. He's co-authored a book on computer graphics for landscape architects uh, in 2008 and has a second book, uh, Color and Landscape Architecture, published in 2016. His topic tonight has been one that he's been exploring for some time. He originally presented an initial paper on the topic in 2009 at the Co uh, Council of Educators in Landscape Architecture. We look forward to hearing how his understanding on the topic has grown and deepened over the intervening years. His topic for tonight, learning from Robert Venturi's Learning from Las Vegas, 60 years later. Please welcome Professor Butrago. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. And um, let's start with a couple of things. Um, originally, I published this in the, um, like Professor Soil just mentioned, in a CELA conference in Tucson, Arizona back in 2009. The original title was Looking Back at Learning from Las Vegas. Uh, 50 years later, almost, and let me um, make a little clarification on that. Um, the book was published in 1972. Um, we are in 2021. We subtract that. We actually have 49 years, so it's almost 50. Um, that just proves the fact that college professors fail math, and we cannot do math. I don't know how this happened. Um, it's my, my bad. I will take full respons responsibility of that. Um, <laughs> it's just human error. We didn't, we didn't check our math. But anyway, the point is, it's 49 years later almost 50, um, so um, the historic preamble is, um, this book was published back in 1972. Uh, the title was Learning from Las Vegas, The Forgotten Symbolism of Architecture Form. By then, Yale professors, Robert Venturi, Dennis Scott Brown, and Steve Eisenhower. Um, and I just double checking that, yeah, I'm sharing the screen. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Venturi passed away recently. Um, he was the, my, my understanding was the principal of Venturi Scott Brown and Associates. And of course, behind every successful man, there's an incredible, brilliant, strong woman behind them. And that was his spouse, architect Denise Scott Brown, who also co-authored equally the book, um, yes, I know sometimes we actually emphasize the first name on the book, on the author, basically for library purposes, but this is a book that was actually written by three wonderful individuals. Um, she was, of course, a spouse and business partner of Venturi Scott Brown Associates, and they also co-authored the book with architect Stephen Eisenhower, uh, who also unfortunately passed away. Um, he was a grad TA for Venturi at the time of the publication. Um, I believe later down the road, he came to work with the uh, Venturi Scott of Brown Associates. Um, and, uh, but for my grad students who are watching, there's hope you can actually join your fellow faculty in trying to write a book and become famous. So there's hope for that. So, but these are the three main authors of the book, they equally share the, um, the publication and they each equally contribute to the book. Um, so in, in following the start preamble, um, that's just a picture of my book that I have a paperback copy. Fortunately, I was not able to afford the actual hardbound. Um, it's actually a case study and visual methodology of uh, is basically emphasizing contrast of the aesthetics, the skill, the Fremont Street versus the strip. So there's two areas that the book at the time in 1972 focused on. Um, at the time, it was considered controversial. And the reason why, because there was public interest versus private interest. Um, here's where the public is trying to establish a dominant over the private sector, and the private sector was not happy about it. 
So that's something that was considered controversial for. Uh, it was seen at the time by some critics as a beautification study project to promote screening or the casino signage. So these are the sort of like a socioeconomical aspect of the time period in which the book came to birth. And um, that was a part of controversy. Of course, uh, you know, 50 years later, we know better and we understand, you know, the value of this book in terms of contribution of case study and visual methodology and analysis and the contributions of that to the profession are endless. So it's a very valuable tool still today. Um, just a little bit of, you know, orientation. This is uh, an air photograph from Google Maps from Las Vegas. And you can see the airport area, which is McCarran International Airport. This green strip, if you guys can see my cursor moving down the road, that's Las Vegas Boulevard. This is the original downtown area known as, and this is Fremont Street and the crossing on Las Vegas Boulevard and Fremont Street is considered the center of downtown Las Vegas. So um, the town was actually established along a Native American trail. So a little bit of quick history of the Vegas settlement, uh, which later became the Spanish or all Spanish trail because the Spanish were the first Europeans who set their eyes on the region. Um, and that was pretty much an approximation of that trail. Um, there was a reason why the trail was there because there was natural springs, which the Spaniards called Cienegas. Um, and that was, at least there were three on the area of the proximity where the downtown district is located. Of course, with, a uh, with time, some of those locations have been lost in history books, but there's, a uh, uh, there's one that has been turned into a, a nice um, ecological park near to a mall, which is what the star is showing, the location of that. Uh, the train station, of course, train came followed through and they followed the old Spanish trails and that was a major line that connects the uh, Texas and the Gulf of Mexico all the way to Utah territory. Um, and that's where the train station was located. From there, the Fremont district expanded. Uh, of course, Las Vegas, for those who actually understand a little bit Spanish, uh, means grassy meadows on um, old Spanish. And, and the Cienegas, basically, natural spring was the culprit for that. There was a, a water available, and that was the only green area within 100 of miles around it. So um, this is the uh, sort of the limits of the Fremont Street District, in which the book focuses a lot of analysis on it. And then Las Vegas start to expand out of the Fremont District, looking for more space to expand. And that's when the uh, 1900-1950s booming era of the strip began, and that's when the uh, the big casinos start to de develop big resort developments along Las Vegas Boulevard, all the way to the point in which now extend south of the airport. So, and of course, you know the Interstate 15 and the McCarran Airport uh, are great contributors of the fast expansion of Las Vegas as we know today. So that was a very quick, uh, you know, planning history of Las Vegas, just to give you a little, uh, you know, boundaries here and there. And that's the airport and the interstate, which actually run along side by side with Las Vegas Boulevard. So, all right. So just to rephrase, Native American Trail, following the natural spring, the aquifers, and Cienegas, uh, which brought the... Um, people into the area following the, Sp the uh, Spanish Trail, which later was followed by the Mormon Trail on the way to the, the Utah Territory. And the um, meaning of Spanish, you know, Vegas means grassy meadows. The railroad followed that. And with the railroad came development. Um, and of course, you know, gambling became a form of entertainment for the passengers to generate local income while the trains refuels for their water tanks. So this is what catapult, you know, Vegas development on um, the time period. And this is an old photograph from Google. And uh, you can see the old, you know, building of the, the train station on the back with the classical Spanish, you know, architecture. There's no question that gambling industry transformed the town rapidly. 
and it went from a sleepy town in a quite in a few years to a large expanse metropolis as we see in today in the 21st century so um and the casinos were also part of that equation of development um as a way of entertaining the masses while the trains uh, are getting refueled by water so with that in the 70s the uh, casino industry was highly competitive and they were all trying to capture the market and uh, the use of signage on every building was considered a little bit of you know um, controversial um, some people see this as um, some sort of you know graphic um, uh, littering of the streetscape all the people see that this as beautiful as uh, graphic um, designs and technology came afloat and everything evolved and changed. So here's where the case study from, you know, the authors of Learning for Las Vegas start looking at this sort of landscape and try to analyze, you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly using case study methodology and visual analysis. So, and that's just pretty much a very fast summary of this wonderful book. Uh, but the big lessons from learning from Las Vegas that I can actually sort of like point out, the author coined the terms, the duck versus the decorated shed. So the three authors come up with this idea of explaining Las Vegas. And this is sort of like a very generic picture that I found from Google that actually summarized these terms. The duck is the building that looks like a duck. And the decorated shed is the building that actually sells duck products and it has big lettering and painting and lights and all that, but it's still sort of like a very simple building, rectilinear, with decoration attached to it. So these are the terms that they use to describe the strip and the Fremont Street as well. Um, so the dock in, 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 in summer is the building that takes the form of the advertisement. And there's plenty of examples that, of, of that, that we all sort of grew up around it. I don't know about you guys, but I've seen these big kind of buildings where I grew up. Uh, you, can, you can see obviously what they're actually selling, what kind of products they're selling on these type of buildings. So it's kind of obvious. Um, the decorated shed in, 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 in return is the building facade is the only feature or sort of a featureless structure. And the facade sort of takes the form of a billboard. So, and this is in simple terms. And I'm pretty sure we've seen these kind of examples in every major American city. Um, and th this is the one that probably we grew up most the most in which the only facade is one side of the building. And you can see the building is just a generic box uh, very utilitarian. It, it actually uh, 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 sell the purpose, and uh, because this is the only area that faces the street, that's where they put all the decoration and the gingerbreading of the building. And of course, over here we have a little more modern take on the 21st century. Um, I'm pretty sure you see this as a wine store. Um, that would be nice for so for having some wine at the end of my presentation. Um, anybody game for that? I'm game. <laughs> So going back to the area photograph of Las Vegas, just to give you back to the, uh, the case study, they, they, they emphasize the visual analysis uh, of, the, uh, of Las Vegas in two distinct districts. Uh, one is the Fremont downtown, and the other one is Las Vegas Boulevard, circa 1970s, all right? So let's not forget, this is 1970s. So, the attitude was um, 2021, I mean, and, and is that we want to preserve the historical core. And that's what I've been reading the articles and, uh, and critics about, you know, what they tried to do in the downtown original district, in which now we're looking with nostalgia, all this neon lighting and the signage and all that with such a, such a like a, a museum collection art piece that represent a period in time in American history. So uh, this is something that is going on, and they're trying to preserve that. In contrast, the, uh, the strip 
is in a perpetual state of metamorphosis. That means that everything is changing constantly and the street had become this new modern way of trying something new, something extravagant, something out of, out of whack in many, many ways. So um, it's where they actually have no limits and they just try and see what works. It doesn't work. They implode the building and build something new. So this is what's happening currently with the biggest uh, strip, the strip in particular. They keep changing and reinventing the equation. So just to give you a little you know, feedback on that. So now we go back to Fremont Street. We know tourism is a form of consumerism and what they sell in is flesh. Flesh comes in many shapes and many forms. Um, in the downtown district, the, uh, the dominance of the street access and the alternate station or depot is still part of that downtown district character. The, 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 the current uh, planners and critics of Las Vegas are trying to preserve as part of that history of the, of, of the city. In Fremont Street, that's when we actually can see examples of the decorated shed uh, that is used to lure the masses. Um, there's a visual strong association of the zero facade with the interior. Uh, the signage was part or add on on existing building. The pedestrian scale with the building height the street and the street is still proportionate. So here's where the buildings are not too tall. If you go to the district, it's the opposite. There's definitely a direct connection of the interior and exterior spaces. Uh, the casinos literally open into the street sidewalks. That's something that is in contrast with the street side of the town. So here's the uh, area photograph again, a little zoom in of the Fremont Street. This is where the old train station is located. That's the uh, axis of the Fremont Street on red. And here's the intersection with Las Vegas Boulevard. So just to give you some mandarins. And, uh, so in terms of the duck and the decoration, well, uh, to quote the book, the duck is that special building that is a symbol. The decoration shed is a conventional shelter that applies symbols to it. So we sort of pretty much clear. This is a, a Fremont Street circa 1970s. Of course, I was not born there yet. So that's why I had to rely on Google for these images. And you can see the emphasis of lighting and signage and all built over the structures that were behind. And the structures are not very, um, uh, you know, it's not highly decorated or break down the structure. It just technically it's a box um, that they apply all this decoration as a billboard. And what they sell it is what the actual signs say. And you can go inside the buildings you can actually see here in this photograph how the street still was um, um, a traffic allowed to go through the street. Uh, those who have been in Vegas lately, they turned the street into a pedestrian experience, so they closed the traffic to the street. But here's where we can see still remnants of that connection of the interior of the building with the sidewalk and literally the canopy of the, uh, the, the building extend over the sidewalk. So you feel like you're actually walking into an exterior space but it's actually a decorated shed. So here's an actual picture that actually sort of like um, um, summarized that. You can actually see this humongous billboard and the building behind it that doesn't look in anything like the actual billboard. And that's what the, uh, currently we can still see on the Fremont Street in which the uh, planners and the architecture boards are trying to preserve this character as part of that nostalgia from the 1970s and try to preserve the heritage of the city. And there's plenty of example of that. Um, this is actually now in 21st century. You can see that they actually closed the street to traffic and they built this humongous TV, I'm sorry, I went too fast, um, canopy over the street that sent two city blocks. Uh, and that is just a gigantic TV. And, and the experience completely different from automobile. So they removed the car out of the equation and tried to turn this into a more pedestrian friendly environment. Of course, you can actually arrive by car 
there's plenty of parking decks around the area that fit into the street. So, so in terms of 21st century, here's actually from the end of the Fremont Street, uh, a big TV. And uh, you can see the canopy built over the projecting images and movies over the over the entire length of C two city block long. Um, here's where you can actually see the heights of the buildings are still two, three story high, even though when they build new infill developments with their classical towers, they're just generic boxes. They're not really nothing extravagant in terms of shape or form, but the emphasis is always on the facade of the building at the pedestrian level. So they're still keeping in in, in, in character with the historic uh, precedent established in the 70s on the cityscape. So, and this is today. As you can see, it's very exciting place. It's a total different than Las Vegas Boulevard. Um, I mean, the contrast from one place and the other still, but this is where you can actually still feel the classical 1970s Vegas Boulevard, almost going back to the classical movies from the Rat Pack from the 60s and 70s. So those who actually remember those movies, uh, you know, this is a place you can actually imagine Sinatra still singing, you know, in one of the casinos. And of course, you know, um, because it's tourism, tourism is an industry that it always has to be reinventing. Um, in order to lure the masses, you know, otherwise it becomes too boring for the masses to be attracted. So they keep completely reinventing themselves. Here's an image that actually show you uh, in which they actually turn the neon lights off. So the TV monitor above the street becomes a show. So here's where you have a, a gigantic uh, light show with music and everybody sort of getting to the middle of the city to see this and actually just bring enough energy to this two city blocks to, so they can actually be preserved. And uh, otherwise people will be going all into the strip and then we will have another decaying area of the city. So that's part of the critics and part of the analysis that people are actually arguing about, you know, why this is still necessary, why we cannot do modern things and add new things to the strip or to the street experience, it's just, part of the equation, it's part of that criticism. So going back to Las Vegas Boulevard. So here's Las Vegas Boulevard. Here's the other photograph of the area. Of course, you know, we're not now on the Fremont area. Here's Las Vegas Boulevard. So here's the highlight of that. I'm gonna use Caesar's Palace as the key for the analysis because it's probably one of the few hotels from the 70s that still standing today since you know tourism is an industry that is in a perpetual state of reinventing itself you know to be keep you know uh, themselves you know um current with the taste and desires of the masses uh and the current airport relationship so you can see how the airport and the highway completely reinforces the idea of the street to be further developed so they still can actually move and continue developing south out of the airport. And the tendency is that that might actually happen. Uh, they're running out of space. So uh, um, that's what's happening. A lot of casino developers and investors want to continue building in Las Vegas for that purpose. A lot of money can be made out of casino. That's for sure. So in terms of Las Vegas Boulevard, we revisit again the duck and the decorated shed. And here is where, yeah, sorry, I went too fast. Here's where that is start to sort of like evolve. This is probably from the, we start seeing this kind of development in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s in which the duck sort of like evolved into this sort of uh, exponential, larger than life um, expressions. And here's an ex example of the New York, New York hotel, which is a seascape. So it's not a duck, it's an entire city. And of course, what they're advertising is the New York way of life in the casino interior decoration and all that. So uh, it's part of that. The duck is evolving and changing. And again, you know, they're using symbols and iconic landscapes to lure the masses. So here's an example of the Luxor Hotel, 
in which it do, uh, the, the whole point of this is that you can live the life of the pharaohs, right? Um, and that's actually the sort of like the slogan of the hotel to lure the masses to experience that lifestyle of antiquity. And they're using the architecture of ancient shapes and forms to as a way to communicate that idea of this lifestyle. Here's a Venetian, of course, another example of that same type of, you know, iconic use of iconic landscapes and architecture, where you can see the Palazzo Vecchio uh, Palace and the Monte Vecchio and the uh, Piazza San Marco Tower uh, and the Venice Canals with gondoliers singing opera. And of course, all that leads to this interior space that relates to exterior. So, uh, which I'm gonna show you an image later down the road. But the point is that this is a form of advertisement. Here is where we're using iconic landscapes and iconic architectural elements uh, to promote an image, an experience, a, a lifestyle that will be able to entice ma uh, the masses to come in and live this dream for a day. So here's where they can live their fantasies. So the dog is still evolving and changing. Of course, you know, we have the Paris Hotel, an example of the use of iconic landscape. They actually have their own one-third scale uh, version of the Eiffel Tower with the different art of the triumph right here. And, you know, for those who remember history, you know, the French invented the hot air balloon, the hot air balloon. So they actually use that as their signage. So the signage is still prominent on Las Vegas Boulevard. They just now make it part of that iconic narrative of the hotel. So it's part of that evolution of the dock. Um, some people may say, if this is a cliche, are we going too far? Um, well, that's a debate. That's actually for the critics to, to claim if this is beautiful, if this is horrible, if this is great, this is bad. Well, it's part of that equation. It's part of why Vegas, Las Vegas is an exciting place to analyze because it's always reinventing itself. Is always trying and experimenting. Let's not forget all this architecture is made of styrofoam and and stucco and and uh, fiberglass. So it's it can be reinvented in 10, 20 years from now. So they're always going to continue state of reinventing the duck. So what is the next evolution of duck? Well, if you are familiar with Las Vegas you can actually see examples of where now it's heading. So now they're sort of avoiding the cliches of, or, or the usage of iconic landscapes or architecture and sort of finally start to incorporate international style of architecture and bring in renowned architects from around the world to, so they can actually build their own little um, uh, examples of what the, um, of their, their work. Um, so the, 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 the evolution now is that they're actually not doing the iconic landscape and they're actually choosing iconic architects to design buildings and uh, sort of like abandoning that sort of like cliche, uh, and I keep using the word cliche, uh, I have found a better word to say it, but it's, it's uh, trying to avoid the use of, you know, icons to promote those kind of uh, ideas. So here's an example of that, the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas, so which sort of like um, imply the question, does the duck become a swan? It may for some people, it may not. It's always part of the uh, challenge of the critics to decide which way or the other. But there's a question to, to rise, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and some people may find this beautiful, some people might find this horrendous, but that's part of the excitement of Las Vegas It's just, Part of that experimentation, that permission to try and see works, it doesn't work, we're going to implode these buildings in 20 years from now and building something new. And here's an example of what is heading. This is actually the uh, um, the shops at the Crystal, uh, this building right here. Hope you guys can see the arrow. And the back is the new Aria Hotel. On this side of the street, we're actually looking from the Bellagio. Um, so it's 
if if anybody look at this building, what comes to mind? You know, if this is a quack. <laughs> um, if this is a Frank Gehry um, architecture kind of thing, well, there's no surprises. No, not not in a Frank Gehry sort of Frank Gehrish idea of you know. But this is actually done by architect Daniel Lubinsky, 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 I'm sorry, I cannot even pronounce the name. My bad, La Daniel Lubinsky, um, in which you can actually see that influence of Frank Gehry, that international famous architects, uh, you know. So this is where Vegas now is heading. So the evolution of the duck continued to reinvent itself. So now it's not a duck, it just looks like a regular building, right? Like it, you can see this building in, Miami or New York or San Juan or any other big metropolis of the world. It's uh, just a regular building, but it's still sort of implied some sort of famous architect, perhaps. This is a quack. You guys decide. So in retrospect, tourism is still a form of consumerism to promote and what they sell is pleasure. They still use in architectural iconographies to lower the masses, of course, you know, the visual association. So the buildings itself become big billboards. So uh, it's not much as like, you know, the traditional Las Vegas signage, right? Like I'm showing here, right, in, on your left. But it's still now the building is the billboard. The visual association of exterior facade with interior is still strong. There's no question about it. They're trying to sell this, they're making that uh, intentional. The analogy of architecture and consumerism as a consumerism propaganda is still strong. But here's another thing that, you know, looking at almost 50 years later, and something that I sort of like I started to look into, um, into Vegas. Um, in, the, in the 70s, it was the automobile was the dominant element on the overall design of the strip. But now in the 2020, it's a pedestrian model. So times are changing. Um, the In the 70s, the neo signing was center stage. And there was a strong relationship of the parking lot on the strip with the Porta Cochere, the Grand Lobby, the casino, and the building on the back around the oasis. So let me show you a little bubble diagram that actually show you that kind of like car-centric model of the 1970s. So here's where you can actually see that classical, um, you know, 1970s Vegas. You have the Vegas Boulevard, a ginormous parking lot, almost featureless. The big sign, neon sign, was actually next to the boulevard, advertising the casino. You have the drop-off. So if it is sort of like a interior space organization, you have the lobby drop-off, Casino connects to the lobby, the restaurant connects to the lobby, hotel connects to the lobby. They usually put the pool on the back with some minimal landscaping and uh, sometimes cabanas and all that kind of buildings around it. So this sort of like the visual organization of the 1970s um, design for, for a car centric society of the 1970s. So here is that. And here's the old Caesar's Palace, the one I actually showed you previously as a reference. Here's the front, and you can see the gigantic parking lot, parking lot here, parking lot on the side that sent all the way to the back of the building. Um, the major foyer entry, portico share, drop off, that was the grand lobby. Uh, not sure I can remember which one was the casino, which one was the restaurant, but it was sort of like separate the hotel on the back, the pool on the back. And that was sort of like the uh, organization. And that pattern was actually repeated in all the other hotels around it. So here is where you see the arrow. That's where the current Bellagio is located. So this old hotel was completely imploded sometime in the eight, early 80s, not 90s, to make up for the new Bellagio Hotel. So. Notice the absence of the new towers and the new development on the Caesar Palace. So here's more views of that kind of panorama. So you can see here this gigantic parking lot. Not much about a sidewalk. This sidewalk here was about 
what, five, five feet wide. Um, not much planting, not much landscaping. Um, very kind of desolated because the idea was that you drop the car and then you go to the casino inside the hotel. The prominence of the signage with the neon lining was still dominant. And each one was actually, each hotel has their own design, their own billboard propaganda. Uh, the Caesar Palace was known for having all these uh, models dressed up in Roman characters waiting at the masses as they drive along the Vegas Boulevard to say, hey, come in, have fun, live like Caesars, right? So that was part of that propaganda advertisement. And of course, you know, for those who are actually interested in graphic design, each one of these classical 70s, you know, not as a typog typog typography, you know, lettering, um, the design, the, uh, the, uh, the neon sign and all that as part of that time period, very classical and sort of retro for us in the 21st century. So here's a current view of Las Vegas uh, Caesar's Palace, and you can still see vestige of the old floor plan, but now it's a total different model, and I'm going to go explain that a little down the road. But here's the 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 prominent the uh, foyer, the Porte Cochere, and the original building is somewhere behind it. But the big parking lot in front of the building is gone, completely gone. It's been removed and put on the back of the building in a big parking deck. The prominence of signage is still dominant today. Of course, you know, technology has made changes. So most of the signage now is actually a big TV monitor, which can actually be updated with new photographs and new advertisement. Um, the, this, now the signage is also part of the experience. So in this one from the Bellagio, you can actually see a tunnel, right? A little pedestrian corridor that leads to the casino. So you're going to be in a cover area so you don't Get exposed to the sunlight. Um, it's a sunshine state, uh, Nevada, where the sun shines and it's very hot. So it's nice to be in an enclosed climate control environment, another way of luring the masses into the hotel to escape the heat of the strip. All right, so the Porte Cochere is still dominant, and you can see here the Paris Hotel with the Arc of the Triumph. I'm going to try to go faster. Oh, oops. 59 years later, right? It's supposed to be 49 years later. Tourism, still a form of consumerism, pleasure, there's no question. Iconis, iconis uh, I'm sorry. The use of landscape iconography to look at masses, still strong. The visual association of the exterior facade with interior, still there. Visual anal analogy, still the same. Consumerism, propaganda, right? Direct connection interior and exterior spaces with sidewalks. This is what's happening today. The strip becomes a pedestrian experience. This is what's happening now 40 years, uh, almost 50 years later, right? It's becoming a pedestrian experience. Um, they sort of trying to reconcile, reconcile the pedestrian and automobile and the outer infrastructure has been concealed from the main street view. The Porta Cochera has been placed on the side of the building, a parking deck behind the building, and now the front of the building becomes the billboard and uh, and the decoration becomes sort of like a swan or maybe still a duck. We'll see. You guys will be the judge. I'm interested to hear what you say. Again, apologies for the map. We don't do map, right? So this is actually the new bubble diagrams of uh, how the new uh, Vegas model has been created. The boulevard is still there. It's not going anywhere. But now there's plenty of spans sidewalks with pedestrian bridges that has uh, uh, automatic staircases uh, and uh, elevators for ADA. And all these lead to the actual buildings. So uh, there's a direct connection of that pedestrian with the building. And also all these are connected from one building to the other. So it's becoming now part of that ex big experience to sort of like casino hopping by just walking up down the boulevard, go to one casino, then go back to the sidewalk and then continue walking down on the boulevard to go to the next one. Um, the, uh, now the casino is center stage inside the building. 
and everything fits into the casino. Obviously, you know, we understand, you know, the uh, economical model of casinos, and they want to expose people to the casino experience as much as they can. So, but they added now um, uh, the uh, entertainment, retail, and hotel and pool. They all connected. The drop off is usually somewhere in the side of the building. Uh, the Caesar Palace is one of the few that actually keep it on the front uh, for classical um, comparison. But the casino is the main thing. Now the entire building becomes a billboard and they planted everything heavily. So the pedestrians are actually encountering this artificial landscape uh, brought into the area because it's a desert. So it should, should not be a very kind of like tropical kind of landscape. It's just, it's a new influence of the new design and new technologies that allow this to happen. So let's see how that looks like now today. So here's an example of of Caesar's Palace again, because it's one of the few references that we have from the 70s. And you can see the Forte Cochere is still there in the front. But now you can see how they put the pool. They built a new retail space that connects to the casino. They had the forum for the entertainment, restaurant, everywhere, landscape. Everything is being a little more buffer, a little more environmentally pleasant um, to create the illusion that you're not in actual desert area or arid space. Here's a little bit of the uh, Bellagio, but this is a new way of designing the strip. Here's a street view of that, which shows how the pedestrian actually experience now the Vegas Boulevard. Of course, pedestrians are not allowed to be in the, on, on the boulevard, on the street. But here you can, you can see the escalators, electric escalators going up and down into a pedestrian bridge so now the bridges actually have those kind of like uh, automatic sidewalks like in the airport. So it just pushed the masses, literally. They have elevators, so they're environment, uh, uh, ADA uh, uh, compatible. And you can see here in maybe intersection how the buildings are connected through those bridges and those pedestrian bridges lead to interior of the casino and or the retail space or the restaurant. So again, it's actually taking the people from the street and lure them into the building. That connection is still there. And now it's more extravagant and more stronger. They're trying to allow people from hopping from one hotel to the other in a more easy manner. But they don't want people to be crossing the street for obvious reasons. These are at least 10 lane roads, high traffic. So they want to try to minimize accidents. We understand pedestrians and cars do not mix well. So here's an example of an attempt by the city of Las Vegas to reconcile that kind of like a scenario. Hopefully I'm doing good with time, um, almost. I think I have 10 more minutes. So here's another view of, Las of Caesar Palace. And you can see here how they actually create barriers to buffer the pedestrians. So not to be along the street. And here you have the traditional boulders. So again, it's actually trying to prevent that connection of car and people together in the same spot. And now the pedestrian experience has become a little more pleasant with greenery, restaurants and cafe along the way, uh, making it easy for people to climb the steps by using st uh, staircases and all that. 50 years later, what we learned from Vegas, tourism is still a form of consumerism. There's no question about it. And every hotel, it's actually on competition against each other for the attention of the masses. Um, so that's why the, the hotel industry or hospitality industry is always reinventing themselves and try to bring the shows to the street level. And that way they can lure the masses to the shows inside the building and more likely encourage them to play casino and bet up all the money that they have, right? Because that's still part of the economy of the city. You can see here some of the vestige of these signage that now is still part of the equation, part of the overall design of the building. It's still the billboards, but now they're sort of like more um, in tune with the architecture style that they choose for the buildings or the 
iconic landscapes or iconic architecture that they're using to recreate to rule the masses. Again, I cannot do math, right? So the duck as used to lure the masses? Absolutely. They're still using that. New York, New York, as far as I know, is still thriving and people are paying big bucks to stay in this hotel. Um, it's still using iconic landscapes and architecture. In this case, the cityscape and a collection of, you know, famous monuments from New York City. You can probably recognize the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, Grand Central Station, Statue of Liberty, and so on. And here's where the view from one of those pedestrian bridges into the hotel. Here's the pedestrian bridge, and you can actually see the staircases that leads up from the boulevard into the building. The visual association of Sierra Facade with interior is still strong. So here's an example that I was mentioning before. Uh, here's a Venetian. Remember that picture from a Venetian? Here's the Venetian inside, and this is actually the retail mall inside the casino. So uh, in which the uh, masses are lured to go into this cleanup version of, of Venice. Um, I was in Venice back when I was in college, and I'm, I can swear that this Venetian canals are a little cleaner than the actual city of Venice. Um, for those who actually been in Venice, they actually know what I'm talking about. Um, in Venice, was the is actually you know the open sewer, so there's a little smell coming, and it's a tidal wave. So you know the uh, the ocean, you don't get that. All you get here is chlorine water, but it's still you know, an artifice of creating this sort of Venetian experience. Like you went to Venice and you see the magnificent Renaissance architecture of the city of Venice in full display. At the same time, you can actually shop for your fa famous merchandise. So it's part of that consumerism propaganda that the masses are lured to. The visual analogy is still strong. Here's the life of the pharaohs, right? Live the life of like a pharaoh in an ancient time. And the interior spaces on this one are completely Egyptian in shape and form. So here's the grand alley of the fences that recreated to lead and lure the masses into the actual pyramid, which climate control inside. And of course, everything is made of fiberglass and, and fake and stucco and all that, which lead to uh, an, uh, um, an argument that these kind of architecture are temporal. They're not deemed to be uh, permanent structures, which makes sense since Vegas is always in a, especially the strip, is in a perennial state of evolution and changing because the taste and the desires of the masses are in a constant influx state. So this is where they can actually use fiberglass in the middle of the desert, which actually it required a lot of maintenance because, you know, plastic degrade with sunlight. So those who understand construction understand the limits of those kind of materials. But, you know, it, it makes sense. It's part of that kind of like allowing the city to be able to reinvent itself every often as necessary. 50 years later, the strip becomes a pedestrian experience. There's no question about it. Um, it, this actually comes to life at night because obviously the climate is much better, a little more pleasant. And uh, the people go from one hotel to the other to experience the entire length of the strip. And each hotel tried to create some sort of entertainment, outdoor entertainment as well, as part of that billboard advertisement. Some may argue that, yes, the automobile and the pedestrian have reconciled. Um, and in some instances, the bridges take the form of the architecture of the hotel that is trying to, to promote. So it's part of that reconciliation. The uh, auto infrastructure has been concealed for the main street. And that's just to reinforce the pedestrian emphasis of the city, of the new 
way or two is in the strip. Also part of the, uh, by concealing that from the view, you actually encourage people to walk and experience the strip. So here's where you can see the Bellagio, the Aria Hotel, the Paris Hotel, and so on. So the question is, if the decorated shed becomes a swamp, perhaps. That's something that uh, fascinated me and uh, uh, everybody can, uh, talk about this issue or this topic, they have their own opinion about it. Um, some people feel it's a cliche, some people feel like it's exaggeration or necessary. Some people still believe that it's valid, that we still can use them, and as long as it serves a purpose, but the debate is still on. So conclusions, there's no question the authors of the book make a great contribution on case study methodology and visual analysis for assessment, which are great tools for analyzing by contrast, past and present work of architecture, as well as landscape architecture. Images provide us with a mechanism to evaluate visual information in order to assess and understand the impact of the physical work. So this is something that very valid, especially for my grad students who are actually paying attention to the lecture today. So we can actually use images to analyze and get information and understand the world. Um, some of the books I actually recommend to, to my grad students are Visual Research Methods in Design by Henry Sanoff and also Case Study Research Design and Methods by Robert Yee. Two great books. And other than that, I'm gonna try to allow for questions. So I would appreciate any questions you guys have and and here's some ideas. I need a new picture for my profile and CV because uh, I think the one they use for the advertisement, show me with hair. So here's some pictures that you may want to consider to as an option for my website. So other than that, thank you for indulging me. I appreciate your time. And now I'm gonna stop and lead it to the leader.